Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. Destroyed is how neighbors in a northeast side subdivision describe what happened to this house. To think in its original condition, this house was estimated online to be worth $300,000. Neighbors say they've been puzzled why the house appears to have been randomly torn apart bit by bit, unlike other remodeling jobs. Jesse DeGoyato tells us they're also concerned it's become a safety hazard. Pheasant Ridge is considered a well-established, family-oriented neighborhood. Yet there's this house, or what's left of this house, near the front of the subdivision. You would think that a tornado came through and sat down on that house and then went back up. With no other damage around it. At first, neighbors thought the owners were remodeling, but none of the construction debris had been picked up. And then the neighbor next door took this photo of someone with a chainsaw on the roof. It was very obvious that it wasn't uh, remodel anymore. Like it was, it was definitely to destroy the house. It's like someone came through from the inside and punched everything to the outside. The roof is gone, so is the siding and the windows and practically everything else over several days. Neighbors say occasionally they'd see small work crews at the house. This is what's left. If you can just see through the house, the sides, the front, just two by fours, you know, it's just sad that a really nice house was destroyed like this. Neighbors say they've talked to a man who says he's the contractor hired to work on the house. Timothy Davis says maybe they should consider starting a destruction company. Because they are good at tearing stuff down, that's for sure. Case at 12 News has learned the house was involved in a lawsuit that later involved an eviction and foreclosure. Whatever the reason, the house is in the shape that it is. Neighbors say they worry what's now an eyesore could attract curiosity seekers, especially kids out of school for the summer. So what's going to stop them from going inside of that house and something collapsing on them? On the northeast side, Jesse DeGoyado, KSAT 12 News. Now we are told code enforcement has posted a stop work notice given there's no permit. As a spokesperson says, after there is no permit pulled, a citation will be issued to appear in court. Also, an inspector will be out tomorrow to decide what to do about the house including securing that property. The San Antonio Independent School District, a target for thieves overnight. They stole roughly 20 catalytic converters from the main SAISD vehicle yard on the city's east side. The district says the parts, which are valued for their precious metals used inside them, were stolen from its maintenance fleet stored on Roland Avenue near I-10. But they're hoping that it will be harder to unload these particular parts to any salvage yards since they're painted and with the district name inscribed on them. If a salvage yard sees um, a catalytic converter that's been painted bright orange, neon orange, like from the 80s, um, and it's inscribed SAISD on it, do not take it, do not buy it. The district says its police department and SAPD are now investigating. And clearing up the confusion about your second vaccine shot. Each of the two dose vaccines have different time frames for when you're supposed to return for your second shot. We're talking about COVID vaccines. And while you're allowed to go a little longer than those recommended number of days, there is a cutoff. Courtney Friedman found out what that cutoff is and what experts say to do if you've gone over it. If you got the Pfizer vaccine, you're supposed to get your second dose after 21 days. For the Moderna, the second shot is at 28 days. The interval of the prime dose and then the boost was chosen based on previously known responses to vaccines. UT Health San Antonio infectious disease expert Dr. Ruth Berggren says there wasn't enough time for researchers to design complex studies for five or six week intervals. We know we got really great results, 94, 95% protection. If you want to have the outcome that is promised, you should get your vaccine in the way that it was studied. Still, there are recommendations about leeway for the second doses. There's definitely a two day grace period for getting your shot two days early. That can happen. As for how late you can get the shot. For both of them, the CDC says 42 days is your outer limit. So that would mean going to either a, being three weeks late 
or two weeks late. That limit has to do with protection. Berggren said if you're past the 42 days, you still can get the shot, and many health professionals recommend it. It's better to do that than to remain only partially protected. She said it won't hurt you to get the second shot later than 42 days. The side effects don't change. It's just the level of protection that might. She said if you get turned away from a vaccine site because you're past 42 days, try another site or get a doctor's note. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. It's recommended you go to the same location to get your second shot as you did for your first. However, it's not mandatory. And if you can't make it back to that first location, then you can find another one that's easier. Dr. Bergeron says the most important thing is that you get that second shot on time if there's any way you can. New at six, COVID-19 restrictions continue to ease up at the Kadena Reeves Justice Center in the Bear County Courthouse downtown, making it easier for jury panels to be selected and trials to take place. Erica Hernandez has the latest on the new health protocols and an update on those backlogged cases. Things are going to change. Since jury trials were allowed to resume last week, restrictions have continued to ease and social distancing standards have changed from six feet to three feet for unvaccinated persons. The updated protocols are moving very fast. Things seem to be improving very quickly in our community. Um, we can see it, and as a result of that, we're starting to loosen things up in the court system. These changes already noticeable as jurors sat in the jury box for the first time since the pandemic forced courts to close last spring. It doesn't matter. The new protocols also allowing for more trials to take place as well. Before today, the most that the county courts could have that would be two jury trials on any given day. As of the day, they can now have four jury trials on any given day. The latest order runs until August 1st, and then after that, it's expected even more restrictions will be done away with. And as a result of jury trials returning and restrictions easing, the backlog in cases yes. is already decreasing. More than anything, it's not just the jury trials that move cases, it's the threat of a jury trial that gets cases moved. So just how many cases have been taken care of? Well, in the past four weeks, over 200 cases have been settled. At the Cadenaries Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. San Antonio Police and Crime Stoppers are asking for your help in finding the person they say is responsible for a fatal hit and run crash. It happened back on January 13th in the 8400 block of New Laredo Highway near South San Antonio High School. That's on the southwest side. Police say the victim, 48 year old Cynthia Gomez, found dead on the side of the road. Her injuries matched to getting hit by a car. A gray or silver Nissan Maxima spotted fleeing the scene. This is a picture of it. Authorities are now looking for the vehicle's owner. Anyone with information on this case asked to contact Crime Stoppers 210-224-STOP. Information leading to an arrest could earn you up to $5,000. New at 6, some seniors have reason to celebrate these days. After a year of confinement in many cases in nursing homes or assisted living apartments, Vaccines have given them a new lease on life. And today, several hundred San Antonio seniors finally joined together for the reopening of their new senior center. The Blessed Angels Senior Community Center's doors are wide open for Fiesta. Blessed Angels had just opened in January of 2020, and then COVID hit. By March, its doors closed to seniors and it was forced to pivot. Since then, it's been a parking lot food giveaway center only. Today, back to full service with a mini grocery store, craft and computer center, and more. It's fantastic. It's been over a year. People have been isolated by themselves. With the COVID, and it just like kept everybody in, worried about the loss of the loved ones and just wanting to one day get back out. Simply going to a party like this, they say, heals a lot of the loneliness they've come to know. And uh, I just, you know, been trying to keep my spirits up and being able to come here a couple of times recently has really helped me a lot. I come here and I get treated like royalty. Those responsible for that royal treatment, like Blessed Angel CEO Marion Thomas, organized huge parking lot food giveaways every week not giving up the mission, even in a pandemic. These ladies here, they showed up and showed up, and so it's just a pleasure for us to get back in the battle with them. 
The city-run senior community centers are in the process of reopening now as well. The city hopes to have them all back up and running in about a month or so. All right, that looked like a fun event. <laughs> a fiesta indeed. Yeah, all right, live cam, 91 degrees out there. And the still. haze and humidity oh. still with us. Oh, yes, mm. it is. Yeah, it's that time of year where we get that blanket of haze, and it's pretty thick. A lot of moisture in the air, a little bit of smoke in the air. That's really the only particulate I could find. Aquifer down two-tenths of a foot today, but we're still more than eight feet above average for this time of year. Here's your pollen count. This is important mold. It's moderate at 830, but that's significantly lower than previous days. It's starting to be on the downswing with the lack of rainfall. However, the high humidity in the air is mitigating that drop a bit. Grass on the low end with the count of 20. Temperatures now upper 80s right near 90, 92 Stinson, 91 Castorville, 90 in Helotus. Meanwhile, 88 currently in Bulverde and 88 in Seguin. As we go through the evening, very sticky outside. It's all about the humidity. We're going to talk heat indices and how long this humidity is going to stick around coming up. Myra. All right, thanks, Adam. To ease the congestion on I-35, there is a push to get big rig drivers to take a different path. The incentives being offered to the drivers who make that switch. Next. But first news around Texas police in Houston searching for suspects. They say opened fire outside a bar early this morning. Four people hurt in the drive by shooting. They're all expected to be OK. Based on the shell casings found at the scene, investigators say it was likely a high powered rifle was used. Police are looking for three possible suspects. Officers say they've stepped up patrols in the area. Another one of the state's most wanted fugitives is now behind bars. 25 year old Tion LaShawn Lagan arrested in a Fort Worth apartment complex. He'd been on the run since May of last year, wanted for unlawful possession of a firearm, possession of marijuana and a parole violation. Lagan, a member of the Bloods, was sent to prison in 2015 after his conviction in Tarrant County on several charges, including aggravated robbery with a deadly weapon and burglary. A tip called into Texas Crime Stoppers led law enforcement to his arrest. More construction is on the way for many stretches of I-35 between San Antonio and Austin. Yes, more construction. Yeah. That means more delays for drivers. Samuel King joins us now. I'm sure he's going to clear this whole thing up. <laughs> Sam, there's new efforts to get <laughs> freight traffic to take an alternative route. Yeah, that includes SH-130. That's the toll road that runs from Georgetown to Seguin, the southern 40 miles or so of that stretch are privately operated and a company that runs it and is offering rebates and rewards programs to get drivers to make the switch. Getting stuck in traffic can be more than just frustrating for truck drivers. It can also mean the difference between goods getting somewhere on time or not. And in doing so, you're always looking to the most certain path from point A to point B. And, and consider that you've got to fit within a certain hours of service for the day for the driver. John Esparza is president of the Texas Trucking Association. He says increasing congestion on I-35 is making that certainty more difficult to obtain. So, and you know, many times that's such a, a uh, it can be such a quagmire of different things that can contribute to, uh, you know, the day in the life of a truck driver. His group has announced a new partnership with the SH-130 concession company. The rebates and incentives aim to boost efforts to get more freight traffic to use the privately operated toll road as an alternative to I-35. The privately owned portion runs from Mustang Ridge in Travis County to Seguin. As an industry, which we always have mixed emotions with tolls. Adam Blanchard owns Double Diamond Trucking just off Southeast Loop 410 in San Antonio. He says it's often worth the extra miles and costs to use the toll road. It's great to have an option available to, to our drivers and to our industry where we can bypass heavy congestion because that results in a safer roadways for everybody and less opportunity for accidents. And SH-130 CEO Doug Wilson reports more drivers are now using the toll road than before the pandemic. The additional, uh, you know, freight traffic, particularly, you know, on the sort of Laredo North uh, routes um, has been very strong and we've certainly benefited from that. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're seeing more traffic than we've ever seen on the roadway.
That increase also includes regular drivers as well. As for construction on SH 130, Wilson tells me there's not too much planned, just some maintenance here and there, but nothing like what's coming on I-35. And of course, we'll have that more than that in the coming weeks and months. Uh, traffic this evening, pretty busy. Seguin right now as we head over uh, to the uh, traffic wall, looks fine on I-10 out there, but some still a lot of red in the San Antonio area, including a big problem here, 410 at 151. You see traffic down to three miles per hour, so basically uh, not moving there because there is some sort of crash. So what's that's doing to your travel time? It's taking 20 minutes just to get from Ray Ellison to 151. And here's a look at that scene on Transguide. You see the fire Fire trucks there, ambulance crews working. So some big delays there in the west side. Loop 410 at 151. And we'll have another update on this coming up in the next half hour, guys. Thank you, Samuel. Let's go from traffic fatigue to tranquil <laughs> flowers. This is the Botanical Gardens. Love this shot from Sky 12. Looking so green. I bet they're bracing for a weather change. All the rain we've seen and now things feeling a lot more like summer for us, Adam. And the humidity, yes, yeah. but at least it's very green and colorful out there. You know, I've always wanted to have one of our city cams up on their observation platform. Ooh. It's such a good spot. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. Hint, hint. <laughs> Not so subtle. <laughs> Not so subtle. It'd be fantastic. Anyway, let's talk about really what's going on outside in terms of the main headline and what people are talking about right now. It's the humidity. It is thick. I mean, it feels like we're right along the Gulf Coast line in the summertime. You look at the heat index or the feels like temperature. Feels like 98 San Antonio, 102 Pleasanton. Catula feels like 107. Del Rio feels like 109. Dew points even along the Rio Grande, well into the 70s. This is about as sticky and muggy as it gets around here inland from the Gulf of Mexico, especially when you get toward the Rio Grande, even into Dryden. Usually Dryden sees that dry line. Not so much right now. We are well into the 70s with our dew point, so it's that oppressive humidity. If you exercise outdoors, you especially know what I'm talking about and are very familiar with it. And you can't really escape it any time of day. You know, we, when we get in the heat of the summer, I always suggest exercise in the morning, by the afternoon near 100, but in the morning near 80. And that's not the case here with the humidity. It's with us all day long and it's going to be here for the rest of the week. Now, yes, we'll see some minor modifications, maybe trim off a few degrees from that dew point temperature for the end of the work week briefly, but that's going to be it. So this stickiness is hanging around. The stickiness is sticking around. 90, that was a spreester one, wasn't it? That's, that's why I was chuckling over here. Yeah, that's why I was shaking that my was head. That was terrible. Yeah. Thank you, Myra. <laughs> Myra rolled her eyes. You. Thank you. Good. True. All True. right. I said better you than me. <laughs> Greg said better you than me. All right. Let's. It's quiet weather. It, we're, air temperatures right now, 80s to some 90s. But here's the big picture, and I know we talked about this over the weekend a bit, but over the weekend, it was much hotter in the Dakotas, Minnesota, the Northland, than it, even Chicago, than it was down here in South Texas. And even Minneapolis has this beat right now at 95 degrees. Denver has us beat at 90. That thick humidity really prevents us from really warming up a whole a whole lot. The humidity gets some of that energy from the sun. Here's a look at our satellite and radar. There's the dip in the upper level flow, the circulation disturbance on the base of that's where we had another storm complex in North Texas. It threw an outflow boundary our way, kicked off a few sprinkles this morning just north of San Antonio. And Whenever we get those low morning clouds, sometimes you'll notice a little bit of moisture on the windshield. That's going to be the case the next several days, but any shower activities likely to stay out of our area. Upper level ridge, big blue H, that bump in the upper level flow, it's still in control of our weather. It may not be directly overhead, which will limit our heating a little bit. So high temperatures near average, but it's going to be influencing our weather. Then by Sunday, it moves over the four corners. And the importance of that is we actually have this northerly flow aloft. We're removing ourselves from the center of that high, and that opens the door for some disturbances. And I think we'll have some. So that will be our first chance of storms by late Sunday. As for this evening, just very sticky and muggy outside. Temperature still near 80 at 10 o'clock midnight. Not dropping a whole lot tomorrow morning, mid to upper 70s with that high humidity, a stray sprinkle leading to sunshine, feeling like 100 tomorrow afternoon, southeasterly breeze at 10 to 15. And we do this over and over again on into the weekend. But I do think we'll add just a few degrees to that high temperature, making it to 94 by Saturday and Sunday and Sunday. Yeah, that 20% chance then again, Monday and Tuesday. All right. Thanks, Adam.
All right, is the Cowboy is the Cowboys QB one ready? Let's check mm. in with Greg. And according to the head coach, it's full speed ahead from here. When we come back, the latest update on Dak Prescott as they get ready and in fact open their mandatory mini camp today. And Aaron Rodgers is now officially a holdout for the Green Bay Packers coming up. It is what it is, man. And uh, we'll focus and we'll control and, and, and work on the guys that are here. For the first time in his career, Aaron Rodgers has missed a required minicamp, and it doesn't sound like the Packers are too happy about it in big board sports, but first. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys quarterback Dak Prescott will be a full goal for training camp that kicks off next month. That's according to his head coach, Mike McCarthy, as the Cowboys open their mandatory minicamp today. Prescott suffered a season-ending injury when he not only dislocated his right ankle in a game against the Giants last October, he also suffered a compound fracture that required two surgeries to completely heal. Now, seven months later, he's back and expected to be at full speed, participate in all the drills come training camp. He's done everything. Uh, he hasn't missed. He hasn't missed anything um, that's been slated. I mean, you know, he's doing a lot of extra, frankly. So the anticipation would be him for him to go to every day is is the outlook. So, but I, I would anticipate a start with him in a in a full mode and you know get him into the team meeting. Excuse me, the team periods and um, just you know get back to playing football. I think the Cowboys must have full confidence in Dak's ability to bounce back since they signed him to a four-year, $160 million contract that contained a record $66 million signing bonus. Also fully participate in the first workout of the mandatory minicamp for the defending Super Bowl champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Tom Brady, the seven-time Super Bowl champion, participated in full on the first day of workouts today after holding their media day yesterday. Head coach Bruce Arians had suggested Brady might have more of a coaching role in their minicamp since he had off-season knee surgery, but that was not the case. What went into that decision? for him to participate today the doctors and him you know they both they both said he was he was good to go and uh you know we'd still be careful with what we're doing with him and uh but uh yeah trying to stop him from playing is is pretty tough he looked fine i had to pull him out a couple i didn't the first period i said okay you can have four they kept begging to go back in but uh the only thing i didn't want him in was the blitz period where you know some guys might get around him too too quick and this was the first full practice for everyone with the Bucks. after Aaron told all the veterans to stay home during the organized team activities. Meantime, Aaron Rodgers is a no-show at the mandatory minicamp for the Green Bay Packers. Not unexpected since he missed all of the organized team activities while vacationing in Hawaii, has made no secret of his displeasure with the organization who moved up in last year's draft to take quarterback Jordan Love. Devontae Adams missed all of the organized team activities along with other veteran receivers in what appears to be a show of support for Rodgers, but he was on the field today and was asked if it would be better for him since he's in a contract year if Rodgers were on the field with him. There's so much that goes into it. Um, you know, that, once again, that's, that's positive, a very positive outlook, but it's, it also can be viewed as selfish, and I don't want to put any pressure on anybody that would be in that situation, let alone, um, you know, Aaron Rodgers. So we're going to let him figure it out. And, you know, I'm sure he's already thinking, of course, I want to play with Tay. So um, I'm not saying anything that's probably not always already on his mind. Now, this is the first time the reigning NFL MVP has held out of any workouts with the Packers. Now, Green Bay officials have to decide what they're going to do or if they're going to start fining Rodgers over $93,000 for missing the three-day minicamp. This after he's already forfeited a $500,000 bonus for missing OTAs. That's a lot of money to make a point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and will he be with the Packers when the if, season comes around? If, if, or when training camp is here. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Our KSAT Q&A is up next. It is time for our KSAT Q&A where we like to have people on and dig a little deeper into some of the uh, major issues of the day. And on Tuesdays, usually we have San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg. And we are glad that he is back with us on this Tuesday after a much deserved day off, you know, with all the briefings and all the other stuff that you'd have <laughs> going on. I'm glad you took a day off for yourself and your family. Uh, right off the top, I want to talk about you're, you're having new council members that'll be joining you on the dais coming up. Your thoughts on the makeup of the new council and what it means going forward for the city. Well, you know, as, as is typical for the last um, age, uh, every two years, we do have some new faces on the city council. So I'm excited to welcome the new 
uh, elected uh, representatives to the city council. We're going to be we're doing that all this week. I think what people are going to find is that it's an incredibly diverse group of people with a lot of energy and that represent a lot of different ideas. In fact, I just got a chance to visit with uh, council elect uh, Castillo and and. You know, a lot of great ideas, a lot of diversity of opinion, which ultimately is going to lead to, in my opinion, good policymaking. It always is true that when we have a, a marketplace of ideas, the best ideas uh, come to the surface and are, and are always in service of the public. So uh, there's a lot of energy on this city uh, or on the city council uh, to move it forward. And I'm excited to get to work. I want to ask you about the city's workforce recovery program, something that voters approved uh, several months back. And uh, going forward, we know in the next couple of weeks, that's when Governor Abbott has decided to opt out of the federal unemployment benefits coming to Texas. So let's talk about our recovery efforts here. How is that going with the city program that's supposed to be helping people who were laid off because of this pandemic? It's going very well, Myra. And you know, I, I think we are going through a, a, an extended transition now as we go fully into our recovery efforts as a nation. And San Antonio, because of the work that we've been doing collaboratively as a community and because of voters who established the SA Ready to Work program that will begin in the fall, uh, have the infrastructure in place for an equitable and, and robust recovery. Already in the Train for Jobs CARES Act portion of the workforce uh, training program, we've had almost 6,000 people in various parts of the pipeline. A lot of them are opting for longer term training, whereby they are receiving a stipend uh, to, to make ends meet. And they're ultimately gaining a credential to allow them for uh, allow them to take an in-demand career that's available here in San Antonio right now. Uh, the vast majority of folks that are enrolled in training uh, and who some of, uh, some of them are already in the job and some for quite a while already, uh, the vast majority of those participants were previously living in poverty. Um, uh, the, the vast majority are also um, in, in areas where we see a lot of, um, you know, again, generational poverty. So we are reaching the folks that need this opportunity and thereby impacting positively their families, uh, but also the entire community. So uh, thousands of people have already been part of this program. And I'm grateful to voters who by almost 77 percent uh, ensured that this program will have another five years of life as we move past uh, the initial CARES Act recovery portion. I want to talk about the police union contract negotiations coming up in a little bit. But when we're talking about workforce, it seems as if there are a lot of businesses that are having trouble finding workers, though, especially maybe in the in the food and hospitality industry. Is there anything that the city can do to try to make you know, make that connection happen between workers and the jobs that are out there. Yes, absolutely. And, and part of the workforce training program is connecting people from uh, intake, uh, you know, signing up for the program all the way through job placement. And the, the challenge for uh, employers right now, though, is that we are in a transition period. And, and the thing that we can do as a community to ensure that people are there to be hired uh, is uh, to do what we have been doing, which is put an end to this pandemic. Um, our vaccination rates now are over 50 percent. We, we're continuing to ensure that vaccines get out to as many people as possible. And San Antonio Bear County has done an, an amazing job of that comparative to the rest of the country and to our state. So we've got to continue to put an end to this pandemic from a health perspective so people come back to work safely. Uh, and ultimately, we're looking at the, the, the where things start to feel a little bit like they did before in terms of economic activity, I, I really think is going to be dependent on schools safely opening in the fall. So as we get through the summer months, putting ourselves in a position for success uh, that ultimately we can uh, see in, in full recovery mode uh, by the time students go back to, to school in the fall. Uh, with regard to the CBA, um, uh, you know, we are in the midst of it now. Uh, it's very important that the new city council and our community stay engaged in that process because we have a very clear set of objectives that we're trying to achieve, namely accountability and ensuring that our police chief has the ultimate hiring and firing authority for the department um, and that the, the process by which um, discipline is, is measured in the, in the department is done transparently and it sticks. Uh, so we have uh, our negotiating position. We've been working with the San Antonio Police Officers Association before the pause. Now that they're back 
in session negotiating a contract, we've got to stay true to those objectives. And as I've said from the start, um, any a, a contract agreement that falls short of those objectives, I am not going to support. So hopefully uh, over the next few months, they can hammer out an agreement that meets those objectives. Both parties back to negotiating now that the council, the runoff elections are now over. And as we covered yesterday, it seems that even though that time has passed, neither side is really budging at this point on those disciplinary procedures. So I'm glad you addressed where you stand on that if those do not improve as negotiations go forward. We'll, we'll continue to watch it and see what happens. And Mr. Mayor, I have one more question for you that Myra and I discussed earlier. Is there going to be a 4th of July celebration in San Antonio or is that by the wayside? I mean, I know we have an abridged fiesta coming up. Uh, there will be a 4th of July celebration in San Antonio. We have a 1.26% positivity rate. It's been below 3% for several, for almost three months now. San Antonians have been working so very hard uh, to protect themselves and their neighbors and loved ones and businesses. And we are in a position if we're mindful again of, uh, of proper precautions uh, and common sense, we are in a position to have a great celebration of 4th of July and also a great fiesta as well. And we, um, if we can do that safely, um, uh, it is something that we have uh, deserved for a long time. So I look forward to being out there on 4th of July. I look forward to being part of fiesta. Uh, we're gonna do it in a little modified way, of course, uh, but it's gonna be one heck of a celebration that San Antonians have long deserved. And I, and I thank each and every one of you uh, for making that happen this year. Um, go have fun, you deserve it. San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg, appreciate your time. We wanted to end on an explosive question. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next time. We'll be right back. All right, thanks. Welcome back, everybody. We do have uh, some big situations here on Loop 410. Uh, we were telling you about this last half hour. Loop 410 northbound at State Highway 151. Police still uh, on the scene here. Uh, not as extensive. We don't see the fire truck or the ambulance, but we still see at least one lane closed off there. So uh, that's going to affect you here. We also have a new situation here. This is Loop 410 at Calabria. I believe this is westbound. You can see heavy delays there this evening, guys. All right, thanks, Samuel. Look outside with live cam right now. This is a nice picture. You can see what just happened here in the studio. Caskey walked across the place with an armful full of thermometers. <laughs> but I think he is now ready to talk about some humidity, Adam. You know, the humidity is not as complicated as severe thunderstorms. <laughs> so luckily, you can catch up with calibration. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Finally catch up with thermometers. All right, so it is very sticky outside. We'll be back in a few minutes to talk about how long that's going to linger around here. I'm not going to say stick around again. Not going to do that. 88 right now. Temperatures just falling to near 80 degrees by midnight. So warm evening heat index, humidity and our next storm chances coming right up. If you're looking for fun things to do around town this summer, our friends at SA Live have you covered. They hit up all kinds of fun spots for the family, and you'll get to see that in just a few minutes on their summer fun special in prime time. Here's a preview. Tonight at 7 p.m., the SA Live Summer Fun Special in Prime Time is making waves. Forget about that long drive out to the coast for water sports. We go wakeboarding just outside of San Antonio. Or at least Mike tries to. And we even get some axe throwing in. Unplug and unwind. We're taking you to this glamping hotspot complete with the scenic backdrop of the Texas Hill Country. As summer is heating up, we show you where to cool off. I lace up my skates and hit the rink to get a hockey lesson from a national player. Four! We hit the green and check out a historic spot for family fun right here in the Alamo City. And David Elder takes us out for some summer eats. That and more tonight from 7 to 8, right here on KSAT 12. All right, I briefly mentioned this at 5, but <laughs> for a guy who grew up in Michigan, I really thought Mike Osterhage would have better ice skating skills. Mike. Maybe that video just showed the, the worst part of those skills. Mm -hmm. I'm, just, I'm just saying. You know, I'm not weighing in on one way or the other. I'm just saying there's probably some good bloopers. Right? <laughs> there's going to be some The blooper good reel for this episode. Because there's some axe throwing. Well, yeah. As well. Yeah. 
wakeboarding. Do you want to weigh in on the ice skating skills of Ostrich? We really need to work on his wrist shot, and then we'll graduate to his slap shot. But if we just jump straight to the slap shot, we're going to get a good blooper wipeout from him. This I'm sure be Mike is thrilled to know that we at 6 o'clock have a great plan. <laughs> For him. We're critiquing the Disney show Mike on Ice. <laughs> Mike on Ice. <laughs> I'd pay to attend. We don't have to tonight. <laughs> so today we topped oh, out at only Mike. 90 degrees here in San Antonio. In the hockey rink, probably 65. Yeah. Right? Usually that's what it is. <laughs> but Hondo 89. Del Rio did make it up to 97 and Catula 95. You know, temperatures that aren't really all that abnormal for this time of year. Actually, we were two degrees below average in San Antonio, but it's the humidity that's been really getting us and making it feel so sticky and uncomfortable outside. So here are the important numbers right now. Air temperature 88. Dew point, the true measure of the amount of moisture in the air. 75, which gives us a relative humidity of 65%. So the air is holding 65% of the moisture it can at this temperature. Okay, what all that boils down to is that it feels like it's 98. So it feels like it's 10 degrees warmer than the air temperature. That's the trend. It's going to be the case the rest of this week. Basically, look at that thermometer in the afternoon and think, okay, factor in the humidity. It's about 10, 11 degrees warmer in terms of the heat index. So feels like 100 in Pleasanton. Catula feels like 107. Del Rio feels like 109. And that's all because of the stickiness, that high humidity, the dew points well into the 70s. Now, usually this time of day, we see these dew points mix out and drop down a little bit, usually down into the low to mid 60s. That's not the case right now. Extra moisture in the air, big inversion above us, all these factors keeping this stickiness around throughout the entire day and even into the afternoon. And I don't really see a big break from this mugginess. There will be some brief periods. We see those dew points drop down into the low 70s in the coming afternoons, but that's pretty much it. And you're really going to feel that stickiness across the state. 80s mainly in East Texas. You get into the 90s Alpine, El Paso as well at 96, 97 Lubbock and Midland, 96 in Del Rio and right now Catula, 95 degrees. So tomorrow morning we'll wake up to mid to upper 70s. This humidity gives us these unseasonably warm mornings. That's what we'll have to start the day tomorrow. Very sticky, low clouds and then afternoon we'll get into the sunshine and I think we'll just barely make it into the lower 90s around here in San Antonio, a little closer to triple digits along the Rio Grande. Hello to us about 92, Bernie 90, New Braunfels 92. Elmendorf and Von Army closer to 93. Rain chances very low. A few sprinkles possible from those low morning clouds that we have. You might see a little bit of dampness on your windshield in the morning, but that's it. Otherwise, actual storm chances up to 20% by Sunday night, Monday, and Tuesday. So we're not talking till the very end of the weekend and into next week. We had another thunderstorm complex off to the north of us last night and early this morning. Started in the panhandle, then pushed eastward through the morning hours through the Dallas area and dissipating in parts of East Texas and all the action right now is basically along and east of the Mississippi and the eastern third of the country. That's where the action is. Big Blue H taking control of our weather. So tomorrow morning clouds, afternoon sun, low to mid or mid to upper 70s to start the day, low 90s by the afternoon, feeling like 100. And then we just repeat it for the rest of the week and into the upcoming weekend. Thank you, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's in case you missed it. At first at five, a second arrest made in a weekend shooting at Alamo Plaza that sent a tourist to the hospital. A 19 year old Avante Bird taken into custody by San Antonio police this afternoon. He is facing two counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. The San Antonio ISD's plant operations and transportation facility holds about 130 vehicles, buses and maintenance attempting target for catalytic converter thieves. We had 20 of what we call our white fleet vehicles, and that is from pl our plant service and maintenance department. Each vehicle's catalytic converter could cost between 12 and $1,600.
and assuming the parts shop has them in stock, it would take around two weeks to get them all repaired. We have an update on a fatal wreck that we told you about over the weekend. A 39 year old man who died in a wrong way crash on Sunday morning has now been identified as Domingo Paz. San Antonio police say Paz was driving the wrong way on I-37 when he hit another driver head on. His vehicle rolled into the wall divider. He had to be cut from his vehicle and was pronounced dead at the scene. Three other people in the vehicle were taken to the hospital and at last check they were in serious condition. The race to vaccinate America now sputtering along, moving much slower than many were hoping for. On average, only about 410,000 adults are getting first doses each day, down from the 1.4 million daily vaccinations in April. At the current pace, the U.S. will likely reach 68% of adults partially vaccinated by July 4th, short of President Biden's goal of 70%. Welcome back, everybody. Still monitoring a situation on Loop 410 westbound at Ingram Road. Major slowdowns there. Taking a look at Transguide, you can see the emergency vehicle still on the scene. Looks like one, two lanes at least blocked, plus the shoulder. So if you know someone traveling in that area, watch out for that, Adam. All right, tomorrow's going to be a lot like today. We're going to start off mid to upper 70s, very sticky and humid. Some low clouds early that'll look like they'll be raining, but a sprinkle or two here and there at best. And then a sunny afternoon, and the humidity is going to stick around all day. So high temperature in the low 90s the next few days, but it'll feel like it's about 101 to 103 when you factor in the humidity. By Sunday night and then into next week, just slight storm chances right now at 20%. All right, thanks, Adam. And thanks for watching the News at 6. SA Live special coming up next.